just like to ma mention one thing, and that is, I know when we, we talk about Genesis, the book of Genesis, and there's a lot of things that, that all of you would have a lot of questions on. But I've only got 35 minutes, so what I want you to do is, if you've got a question, if it's very, very, very serious, and I can answer it in 10 or 20 seconds, then you are welcome to raise your hand and ask me, but otherwise I'm just going to tell you and ask you, can we talk about it after the lecture, and then we can, can talk about it. Because I've got, actually they asked me to teach on the whole book of Genesis, and I've said to them, I won't make it. In one week, in 12 lessons, to talk about this wonderful book, the book of Genesis, it's impossible. So we've made it a little bit shorter, and that is, I've got 22 chapters to handle with you, to teach you on this wonderful book of Genesis, and we're going to start with the lecture one, and that is where we've got to start, and that is that God has a plan. The lecture is, God has a plan from the beginning until the end. You see, folks, that God is a God of order. Just like creation, He has a plan for our spiritual lives that has been documented long time ago. And this plan has got a foundation. If we, do, if we don't have a foundation, we've got nothing. We've got to build on a foundation. And what would you say, what would you say is God's plan for our lives here on earth? When we read, now, all of the people, when they come here and they teach on Revelation, they teach on Romans, they teach on whatever book you said, this is the most important book in the Bible. Huh? They say, this is one of the most important books of the Bible. But I tell you, if you take away Genesis, if you don't understand Genesis, if you don't start with a plan where God started everything, then you lose everything. So, with that, we can say that God has got a plan for our lives through Genesis to understand the foundation. And so, where are we going to start? How important is the foundation of this plan? How important is the Bible for God to you that the plan is God for you? How important is Genesis for that answer? How important is the first 22 chapters of Genesis? How important is the first 11 chapters? How important is chapter 1? And how important is the first words that God said in His Word when He started this wonderful book in the beginning? God. And there you've got it. Lives are changed completely when they discover the plan of God in Genesis. And when they accept that plan of Genesis in their lives. Because when somebody discovers that, his life will glorify God. You look at the people outside and you see if they don't, they don't, if they don't believe in Genesis 1, you can see their lives are miserable. So the golden line from Genesis to Revelation are very important. I put this for you. When you start at Genesis, Genesis is the start of everything and Revelation is the end of it. So if you, if you make a calculation and you've got something wrong and, and, and you say, well, I'm just one degree from this line that's from Genesis to Revelation, that's God's plan for my life, where will I end? Where will I end when I start in the beginning in Genesis? We will say, oh, well, that's not, doesn't matter if we believe, if it's six days, or if God really created, if, and if we are coming from the apes or whatever. So let's, let's forget about that. That's just something that we say, we're just not on the right line what God said in the Bible. When will you, where will you end? Look, where will you end? There. And at the end of your life, and at the end of Revelation, you will be way back from the Word of God. That's why it is so important. There is no going back beyond 
Genesis. Listen. No going back beyond Genesis, Genesis, and no going forward beyond Revelation. Genesis answers the question, how did it all begin? And Revelation say, how will all issue? And everything you've got between Genesis and Revelation. So there are two main parts in Genesis. In Genesis 1 to 11 and 12 to 50, and in 1 to 11, there's four events. You will four, find four events in what, chapters 1 to 11, and that is the creation, the fall, the flood, and the Bible crisis. Babel, what you, what you say? But no, in any case, you understand. And then from chapters 12 to 50, you've got four people. Everything is around four people, and it is Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But we will look, we will look at briefly at chapters 1 to 11, and then from 12 to 22. And therefore, we start to say, we must discover the plan of God in the Bible. To discover the plan of God, the opening words in the Bible is in the beginning God. And they say a lot more than we think. Because God started everything. And God is the start of everything. And I stand and I fall by that truth. And nobody will convince me otherwise. Do you know Darwin? Have you read about Darwin? Yeah, is that, is that man that thinks his, his grandfather is a monkey? Because he said that we come from monkeys. And uh, my father, my grandfather, my ancestors, they are not monkeys. My, they are men, real men. And, and he was attempting to explain the start from a human's perspective. From what I think and what the human think and therefore the huge assault on verse 1 of Genesis. If I can believe what God says about the start and everything, then I will easily, listen, discover God's plan for my life. If I can't, if I can't accept God's plan with creation. How can I accept God's plan for my life? It's not possible. So then, when you read the Bible, then you read there is, there are four beginnings in the Word. It is the beginning, the oldest verse in the Bible is John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what this actually means is he started everything and the text is written in a tone which means in the beginning which was not a beginning and is not a beginning. You understand? God was. My, I used to ask my father, where did it all start? And where did it all end? And he said, you mustn't think about it because if you, if you think about it, you will lose your mind. Because God was in, in, a, in a, a million, billion, you can't even count it. That was the beginning. What well, that was not a beginning. Then the second beginning was the beginning of creation. In Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The whole creation and the earth upon, upon which we live we were started somewhere in the past by God. We cannot even agree what has happened last year. No, we have did this. No, no, that was done. No. So now we don't want to argue about 6,000 years ago and how God started it. And we want to say, no, that's the, wrong, the, the right thing and that's the wrong thing. And then we got the third beginning and that is the beginning of angels. Somewhere in the past, God created the angels and John 8 verse 44 said that he was a lie, a murderer from the beginning. So somewhere in the past, the angels 
there was a beginning of the angels. And then, it's the beginning of mankind. Matthew 19 verse 4 said, And he answered and said to him, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So it's clearly that God has created the man somewhere it began. It didn't take a long time for us from creeping on our knees and then standing up and now look like we are looking now. He created the man like you and me are looking perhaps a bit different, but the same as we are looking now. In South Africa we've got the cradle of humankind in the Stapfontein Caves. I don't know, don't know if you ever heard about that. But that, they said that's where we all started. Everything started there. So they were, were digging uh, uh, there in the rocks uh, between the cockroaches and everything. And then they find something and they say, that's where we came from uh, millions and millions years ago. And the Bible said that God started man in the beginning where he started it. So we must discover the plan of God. If you read Genesis with an open heart, before God, then you will find Him, and you will find the plan of God. All the other stuffs are, listen to me, are theories, not facts. They don't have facts. It's all of them are theories. And that's why they change it every now and then. Then that man got this theory and the other one got another theory. But God said in the beginning, God. So, if we have discovered God's plan, then we must accept the plan of God. Because God said. If I can accept what God said, then I accept the plan <coughs> of God. Believe what God says in the first verse, the first chapter, and the rest of Genesis, because Satan asked the question in Genesis 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and that the Lord God hath made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he also brings the light in verse 4. He said, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall surely not die. And, you want to raise your hand? I thought, oh, I thought you was, want to raise your hand. So, Accept what God said. I you all usually say and always say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I'm a human being, and I haven't got all the intellectual and all the answers, but I know God has got all the answers, and if we have got a proof plan, then therefore we can build according to the plan of God. How stupid would it be? If this people that built this beautiful building, they say we're going to start, and we're just going to start building. You, 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 you wouldn't sit here, and dare to sit here because you will think, is it going to stand? Because it's got to need a foundation. Then we've got a plan, and we've got to build according to the plan, because the need of this building is we've got, we need this, and we need that, and that's why God's got a plan, and if we, 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 if we accept that plan, then we can accept what God said because then God saw. The built according to the plan, then God saw. <coughs> if you look further and you see the instructions around the construction of the ark and the instruction of the animals that needed you to enter and the law and the tabernacle and all that, you will always see that God's got a plan perfect plan and all the truths that are written in Genesis 1 to 22 were given so that it may be well with us spiritually. So we built according to the plan that God saw. What did he see? That brings us to the fourth and that is to please God. Through his plan. And he saw that it was 
good, and then it said, and God rested after His plan was complete. When is something good in God's eyes? What do you think? When will something be good in God's eyes? When He is finished with His, with his work, then you read in Jeremiah 29 verse 11 for you and for me in our lives what he say for I know the thoughts that I think toward you saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end that's what God's plan is with you and with me when will God find rest like God find rest and is completed everything. When will He find rest in my life and in your life? Solely, if I discover His plan, accept His plan, build on it in order that He can be glorified through my fellowship with Him. If you look, like, you look at people in the, in the Old Testament and you look at Genesis 5, 22 and 6, verse 9. Then you see two men who know and live according to God's plan in a godless time in history. And who, who was that? Oh, that was a text now. In Genesis 5, 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. He lived according to the plan of God. He walked with God. Noah, in Genesis 6 verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So many people try. And I hope that you are not one of them. They try to build without a foundation. They try to build on some fantasy, some books, or what somebody wrote. And if we don't believe what is written in Genesis 1, we will have no, listen to me, you will have no intimacy with God. Why? Because God created man to His image. And He wants to fellowship with you and with me. And that's why we read in Genesis 1, 2, and it is... And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. <coughs> to trust God <coughs> beyond what I see, beyond what I know. The text on the truth of chapters 1 to 11 is more than we can think, but the adversary must be seen as a bridge to a deeper relationship to God. What do I mean? Sometimes people say, I don't agree with you on Genesis 1. They say, I don't believe that God created man. I believe in evolution. And you mustn't get cross. And they say, I don't believe this and I don't believe that. <coughs> you must use that to go and dig deeper, duck, to go deeper in the Word of God. If somebody asks me a question that I don't know, if somebody tells me something that I disagree with, I don't see it as an offense. I see it as something to go back to the Bible and say, well, I believe that. Is it really true? And if I've got the truth, I know that I can stand on the truth. And his questions and his, all the things that he is saying just makes me standing more fast on the rock of ages. Do we have any interest? 6,000 years ago. Do we have any interest what happened 6,000 years ago? Is it of any interest to us? Why must we teach on Genesis? It brings us back to the importance of this book. And that is, listen, Genesis I think it's Sidlow Baxter that described it like this. He said, Genesis is the, is the shell of the whole Bible. It is the embryo of some of the largest and most important doctrines of Scripture. The origins of creation of man, matronomy, 
animals that's different from man, some of the dispensations of the world, and the transition between Genesis 11 that we were looking after that uh, tomorrow, uh, or on, when, on, on, on Thursday, the, the difference between what happened between chapters 11 and 12, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of death, of redemption, laws about civilization and morality, Israel as a nation, etc. All of these are important things that if we don't know that you won't understand Romans 9, 10, 11 as an example. Answers are given about the origins of the Chinese people. Where do they come from? Well, there's eyes going up and eyes going down. and Somebody's got thick lips and somebody's got big nose and small noses and somebody are black and somebody are white. Where do they come from? You find it in the Bible. And I can't teach you on that, but if you get the book of, uh, of Morris of the Genesis record, then he explained it as... What, uh, what I'm teaching on is, is, is messages that I've taught in my, in my congregation on just on, on, on Genesis 1 to 11 was about 20 messages. So then we can, you can go deeper in it. I, I don't have time to explain everything, but you must beware. Listen, there's one thing that you must know, and that is you must beware what Revelations, the last book say, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And he which testify these things saith, surely I come quickly even so come Lord Jesus. So it is it is extremely important to believe and to accept that God started everything with a plan and now people come and they ask but who wrote Genesis can you tell me Moses Moses wrote it but now the question is Moses wasn't there in Genesis 1, 2, 3, and up to Exodus. He wasn't there in Genesis. There are log logical explanations that indicate that Moses wrote the book. Research shown that where people were not able to write, their memories were extremely good, and the stories were related by word of mouth around the campfire from generation to generation. I think this is Morris or Phillips that write this. Specifically, the Hebrews wanted their children to know and remember their history when they were slaves in Egypt. So, some of these stories were told to Moses. And God told him to write it. The first chapter, chapter when there was nobody, chapter 1, God said to Moses, it was a testimony from God to Moses and tell him to write it. The history was related in, in two ways. First, there was the family register. This provided identity to people of that time. And we read repeatedly in Genesis that these are the generations of, or these are the sons of. And the second way was, through stories of value. All the great stories of the ancestors were related in detail. So Genesis is full of generation registers and stories of heroes, and so it was also related by the slaves to Moses. And when you read the first chapter of Genesis, you became aware of the presence of God. Without explaining everything in detail here, he describes the wonder of his creation. Why is it that we should read this chapter slowly? If you read chapter 1, then you will see how many times it mentions God. Short sentence and comma and God and God. It's because God wants us to read it slowly, 
there was a man, his name was Harold Fortescue. He was a young and upcoming journalist. And his first assignment comprised 24 pages on one subject. And the editor asked him twice to reduce the length by half. And then he was told to summarize it in one page. And he protested about that because he's got this beautiful story. And the response to the editor, that from the editor was to this young man, this young journalist, young man, you are likely not aware that the Creator summarized His works in ten words. <coughs> in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there it stands. In the beginning of the word, without delusion, without explanation, without apology, in the beginning God in the original Hebrew it is Elohim for God and the im after that means that there were a plurality of persons at the creation who were there at the creation when he said Elohim God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in the beginning because Jesus himself was the creator if you read Colossians 1 verse 15 and 16. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father with the instructions, the Son with the example you remember and the Holy Spirit to help us. When protein was manufactured artificially a foolish Englishman stated I no longer find it necessary to believe in God because they have manufactured protein. And a God-fearing man, George Kelly, responds. He said, I will speak to them if they make something out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing. You read about the foolishness I'm nearly finished. What time must, must I stop? At 9. Quarter past 9. What? Quarter past 9. Okay, still got 5 minutes, then we got to do the rest. Okay. You read the, the foolish stories of myths of the Asian, Asian people of the Egyptians. You know what the Egyptians believe? They believe that the, uh, on, in a ancient ocean upon which an egg was laid from the egg was born a sun god who was who has four sons and from the four sons come the creation and people people actually believe this the greeks believed in the giant zeus zeus with the earth on his shoulders I think you've seen the picture of zeus with the with the whole earth and he was walking around with the earth on his so on his shoulders and the Hindus who believe that the earth rests on the back of three elephants who in turn stand on the back of a giant turtle who is swimming in a big ocean. And people believe all this junk. And God said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you look at the reliability of the word of God and calculate the chances, that Moses could have sucked all these things out of his thumb and start everything. You you know that what the, you're <laughs> sucking your thumb, and and you, you you think people must believe that is true. It's like a baby sucking his thumb. You know, he's he's a child. Could he possibly think about this great creation of God and write to me? Uh, I, I think it was you who was talking to that man and said, well. Or everything he don't believe when we were there at, at, at Winterberg and, uh, and and all the things that he believed but he said that one believed that and that one believed that and this, this is a book written by men it's not a book written by men it's written by men by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when God said write it down what is the possibility that Moses could have think about this and write these things down I used to follow example not that you must get involved in lottery, but just as an example. He said, if a lottery prints 2,000 
card, 2,000 cards per day. And day after day for 5 million years printing 2,000 cards. And this is done by 8 million printers around the world. And only one of these cards are marked. What are the chances of getting that card? Impossible. As small as the chances that Moses could have invented everything captured in Genesis 1. So small is the chance that you will be the lucky one to get that card. It's impossible. It's not from man. It's from God. The first chapters, before man could tell what had happened, were given to Moses to write down by the Holy Spirit, just as the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul at the island of Patmos. God started it all, believe it, or perish. Pardon? Ah, sorry, yeah, Pastor John, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you see, nobody's perfect. In Genesis 1 verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So I understand, and I believe it all only if God's light shines in my heart. Do we have any interest on what happened 6,000 years ago? Yes. It is the foundation of everything we believe today. Why? God has started everything and is the start of everything. And God is a God of order. And God has a plan for you and for me. Our next lecture will be on the, how God describes the completion of His creation. So, you'll have Sittler Baxter translated in your Netherlands and German language. You will get it. We have it in South Africa. In the South Africa? Okay, whatever, but you'll have some of it. <laughs> And, and that's what you're going to write on. But what I want you to do after every lesson of mine, and that you've got 10 minutes to do that, and that is the students follow up, and that is what you must do for yourself now. You've got 10 minutes time to say, what spiritual lesson did I learn from this lecture? I've learned something. And the next one will be, what does it tell me about my personal life, my heart? And the third one is, what action should I take concerning <coughs> what I have learned? My hands. I use the word my hands because what, I'm, what must I do about it? So you've got five minutes to do it on your own. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. That's just help to help you to say that after every lesson, there's something that I want to learn. There's something that I want to do. And if you write it down, then you can keep it and you can look at it again later on. Thank you.